you do any heckling? I did. I, I was upset when the president lied about his statement on Social Security and Medicare. What did and you I say? was vocal about that. I booed the president during that time. I come from New York. We call it the Bronx cheer. When we see something that we don't like and certainly something that somebody was lying to us in our own house, we're going to give some feedback then. So I hope the next State of the Union, the president's more truthful on those key issues. So when you have that line of decorum, you're saying basically that you can be vocal and loud when you disagree with what he's saying. Well, it's unfortunate the president would choose to engage in that rhetoric. And I think he, I don't know why he did it, um, but I think he was right to expect a reaction. Maybe he even did it for that reaction. I hope that's not our future and the president needs to be truthful. Yeah, that's freshman Republican Congressman Nick LaLota proudly declaring he booed President Biden. And the funny thing, and not in that clip is, is her asking him, you know, he, he was talking about how we need better decorum. He was criticizing George Santos, of all people. And then he goes, yeah, well, I did boo him. And his excuse was what Biden said about Social Security and Medicare. And if you remember what that was, Biden said that Republicans are trying to cut or raise the age or hurt Medicare. That's the truth, okay? It's, it's literally, they are planning that. It's in the Republican Study uh, Committee platform, which Lilota supports. More importantly, the authors of Project 2025, the Heritage Foundation, explicitly state that they will raise the age and cut the benefits in Project 25. Like, here's a tweet from Heritage. Yes, we should raise the retirement age. If Congress does nothing, we're going to make it, make it harder to get people's benefits and, and raise it. So, uh, yeah, he's not telling the truth. So the Democrats have got a great candidate, longtime journalist, author, and former CNN anchor John Avalon. He is he jumped into this thing. He's lived in Long Island for years. He's tip, obviously, I say this a lot, not your typical candidate. So I really wanted to get him in the hot seat, have a conversation with him. So I'm excited to chat with him. Again, I'm Fred Wellman, host of On Democracy with FP Wellman, right here on the Modest Touch Network. And this is In the Hot Seat with John Avalon. John, man, welcome to the Minus Touch Network. I can't thank you enough for finding time. I know you're right up leading up to the primary election this week. So thanks for joining me here on the Minus Touch Network. Oh, man, my pleasure, Fred. It's great to be with you. Great to finally connect with you, too. All these years, we've been running in the same circles. <laughs> you know, uh, you've had an incredibly diverse career from you were writing for the former mayor of New York when 9-11 happened. You were at CNN as an anchor. Of course, you edited the Daily Beast. I mean, and now you're running for Congress. I mean, what, what drove you to step into the real politics and run for Congress this cycle? Donald Trump getting nominated a third time by Republicans. There you go. I mean, uh, you know, the, the first Trump cycle, I was editor in chief of the Daily Beast, and we were the first news organization to get blacklisted by the Trump campaign, which was a badge of honor. The second Trump cycle, I was an anchor at CNN doing a daily reality check segment, you know, holding then President Trump to account for his lies. And I realized I, I never thought they'd nominate him after he tried to overturn our democracy on the back of a lie. But here we are. And so I, I talked to my wife and, and I was looking at, at New York being a battleground state, but New York won, which is a, a swing district not being taken seriously. And I said, you know, I think we can win this. Um, this is an important seat to flip. And we've got young kids, so it's not an easy decision. But ultimately, yeah. as both of us said, I didn't want to look at my kids and said we say we could have done more when it mattered most. And this is that time. If you write books about history, which I do, you know, there are times when generations are called on to step up roll up their sleeves and do what they can to defend democracy. And this is one of those times. So that's why we're in this. If we win the primary. We will be well positioned uh, to defeat Nicolota. And, and this is a majority maker district. This is one that if we win here, Democrats held it a decade ago. Republicans have held it since. We, Hakeem Jeffries will be speaker. But we got to win this primary because my opponent uh, ran in 2020 and lost by 10 points. And if, if you lose by 10, there's no reason to do it again. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tough race, and and, and obviously we we've got to take it. And it is a swing district. It was a Biden district, right? It was uh, you know Lolo's kind of a, a weird character. Over the clip of him trying to explain why while he's against uh, you know disrespect, he also turned right around, and booed booed the president, right? You know, so it's kind of talking on both sides, isn't he? Typical, typical. Yeah. I mean, look, man, he's far too far right for the district. He was the first of the eighteen Republicans who represented Biden district to endorse Trump before a single primary. He doesn't even live in the district. He cheered, uh, you know, he cheered the overturning of Roe uh, and said the states now needed to do more. He mocked the bipartisan border security bill. He was silent on Ukraine for six months while those folks fought for their lives and democracy. Uh, you know, he thinks we should lower the age to buy AR-15s. He's never even held an in-person in town hall as a congressman. Wow. So I say bring it on, but we got to play offense to do it. We got to practice the politics of addition, not division and win over independence. And I'll tell you something cool. There are more independent voters here in New York one than any other district in New York state. I see that as wow. an opportunity. 
build a broad patriotic coalition to defend democracy. That's how I think we win, not only here, I think that's how Democrats win nationwide this year. Yeah, and we're seeing this way in the polls. They don't want to elect a, a, a convicted felon. You know, I recently had the opportunity to speak to another great Democratic Long Island candidate, Rob Lubin, who's in your, your next, I think, your next door. Uh, you know, we talked about how Long Island, look, Long Island's never been the most affordable place to live. Let's be honest. You know that better than anybody. But it's even got tougher, you know, since the pandemic. It's got tougher with your district far to the east on the island. You know, how do middle class New Yorkers survive? And, and what can we do? We, you know, how, do, how, does there, how does the middle class survive in a place like that? And what can we do about this it? Look, Fred, this is the number one issue, I think. You know, for a long time as a journalist, I was focused almost unilaterally on, on the question of how we overcome hyper-partisanship and polarization, you know, what, what solutions. And I was focused really on a lot of political reforms, how we change the screwed up incentive structure, you know, redistricting reform, you know, ranked choice voting, things like that. And, and you know, all, all the stuff we know we need to do to strengthen the guardrails around our democracy in addition to civics education and, and other things. But knocking on doors across the district, it's very clear to me this is the number one issue and it's not a coincidence that we've hollowed out the middle of our politics at the same time we've hollowed out the middle of our economy we need to rebuild the middle class that needs to be the sole focus and lens through which we look at every single economic question and i think there are a couple of things we can do uh that democrats can do and deliver on if we take the house uh that will help sort of a, a down payment on on rebuilding trust and credibility first thing we can restore the state and local tax deduction. It's a huge deal in New York. It's been in place for 100 years. We're a state like many blue states that gives more to the federal government than we get back. And Trump and the Republicans raised our taxes out of spite as part of a political stunt. And they're invested in the red state, blue state divide. They're not going to ever do anything about it. But we can because the Trump tax cuts, as you know, and your listeners know, viewers are it, it, they they're set to expire in 25. And if Hakeem Jeffries is the speaker, we'll get it done. And that's an average of $10,000 back in folks' pockets. And then we can do even more. We can we can expand the child tax credit, which we did for one year during the pandemic and yep. cut childhood poverty in half. So that's real things that do Democrats can do and deliver on. And then beyond that, we all need to, we're having a national conversation about housing for the first time in a long time. And, and we need to make sure that Democrats are on the side of, of not only middle class families, but small businesses that we're encouraging uh, the building of new housing that's consistent with the character of our communities. First time own, homeowner loans. Uh, that we're dealing with things like ADUs, these casitas that people can build so that families can stay together. Uh, and, and then I think there's a larger conversation about repurposing old strip malls, something they're doing out west. But we need to be innovative and lead into solutions rather than just fixating on the problems. But we've got to deliver because middle class families feel that they're getting squeezed out of Long Island. They feel like they're being disrespected by a system that works for the super rich and the big corporations. And that's not sustainable as a country. No, and, and it, it really is the basis of who we are as Democrats, I think, is the idea that, that everyone needs to have a way forward. The idea that, that, that Republicans would vote against a child care tax credit, of all things, to, that brought millions out of poverty just kind of makes you sick to your stomach, doesn't it? It does, and it should. So let's do yeah. something about it. Let's win. You know, your Republican, you know, your Republican, you know, I was playing Nick Lolota. He likes to play this game that he's a modern abortion, you know, but just last week you voted for an outrageous extremist amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, stripping military women and dependent, uh, uh, dependent females' ability to seek reproductive health care. I'd say that, they, that he was all for that. You know, it's a, such a key thing we've been giving, and not many are using, but enough that when they are stationed in a state that doesn't have uh, the reproductive care they need, they can go somewhere else. How important is that issue, abortion, reproductive health care, IVF, and now, my God, contraceptives, how important is that to the voters that you talk to as you're making your way around the island? Huge, huge. It's fundamental. And it, look, it's completely outrageous that my daughter is going to grow up with fewer rights than my mother. That's not the American way. That's not the way we have historically formed a more perfect union. And, and, and this is something, you know, being pro-choice is one of the earliest beliefs I remember having, pointing out to people like, the Republican platform calls for a constitutional ban on abortion. People saying, oh, no, never going to happen. And now we realize that Margaret Atwood was a prophet. <laughs> it wasn't just that three justices lied to the American people in the Senate about their determination to do it, which is part of the problem with the politicization of the court. But now we see downstream from Dobbs. I mean, as you say, IVF, contraception, Trump musing about monitoring women's pregnancies. This is dystopian shit, and we got to get our heads around the fact that anyone who's voting for a Republican right now is voting for someone who will vote for a speaker for whom a national abortion ban has been on the to-do list since day one. And, yeah. and here in New York, you can't let folks get away with pretending they're moderate at home and voting MAGA in Washington, which is what Nicolota does every day. Um, so this is, a, this is an issue of freedom. This is an issue of reproductive freedom. And I believe the decision should have an abortion should be between a woman, her doctor, and her God, and not the government. And I think the vast majority of Americans believe that. But we need to play offense on this issue. And I think that's why 
we've seen Democrats outperforming polls and winning special elections up and down ballots, as well as even rejections of more restrictive rules in red states like, you know, you know, Montana and Kentucky. So, you know, this is a huge opportunity for us uh, if we focus on building that broad patriotic coalition. Uh, because there are plenty of, of Republican women who aren't aren't sitting with this. And, and, and this is about defending freedom. We're on the side of freedom as well as equality. And that's a huge asset in building a broad patriotic coalition to defend democracy. I agree. You know, we talk about I talk about issues that are super majority issues and of yep. the biggest one of those. Yeah. Reproductive health care, some form, even in the reddest of states. I live in Missouri, as you know, and even here it's there's 56 percent among women right. or among among Missourians for some form of a right to uh, abortion, uh, whatever it may be. So it really does cross state, uh, party lines in a lot of ways. And it is important. And now we have seen they're showing their real true colors after going for contraceptive and voting against IVF protections. And, and it, it's got to be scaring a lot of the people you talk to and you represent, want to represent. 100%. And, and yeah. they should be. we got to be wide We've got an ERA amendment on the ballot in New York. Uh, that'll help. Strongly support that. But no one should be under any illusion that they're going to be fine just because they live in a state that's traditionally supported abortion rights when the to-do list, you know, Mike Johnson uh, and, and, the, and everything he has stood for and represented uh, is all but a national abortion ban, you know, trying to disbelief in majoritarian democracy. And we see this sort of, I mean, I've written, I wrote a book called Wingnuts 15 years ago about the rise of the far right and reaction to Obama. You might remember that. But Christian yeah. nationalism was a, was a chapter in it, but it was, it was almost an obscure vestige. I was trying to explain, you know, the, the hatred movement and the roots of it. And, and uh, and now it's it's full bore back. And I did a lot of segments about this at, at CNN because it's such a concern. It's also completely inconsistent with any fundamental understanding of the Bible. So there's that yeah. too. And you've had such a fascinating career, John. I mean, you studying you studied our democracy, not just as a journalist and an author, but you were in, as I mentioned, you were in New York City Hall on 9-11. You wrote dozens of eulogies for the firefighters, the police, the victims of that vicious attack on our country by terrorists. 23 years later, we are facing, uh, you know, a deal with, like people who support the architect of an attack on our capital, you know, including your opponents you mentioned, you know, from your perspective, you know, we just saw a Fox News poll that said the number one issue for Americans, even Fox News admits preserving our democracy, right? It's, it really does feel like our democracy is in danger. You talk about these kind of issues, isn't it? It is fundamentally. Let's not get numb to this. And I like seeing people wake up to this a little bit more because this is the foundation we sit on. If you have any under standing of the founders. And I wrote a book on George Washington's farewell address. And he was warning about the dangers of what we would call hyperpartisanship. They called faction precisely because a demagogue could rise to power and fact tyranny on the, what he called the ruins of public liberty. He warned that hyperpartisanship could lead to, quote, occasional riots and insurrection. When I wrote the book, that seemed like a dusty phrase. It's not anymore. We've never faced a major party nominee running on an authoritarian platform, praising dictators, and using a lie as a litmus test of party loyalty and seeing Republicans take the knee over and over again out of some combination of careerism and cowardice. And that's why I think there is a broader opportunity to build a patriotic coalition from what's left of the sane right to the center to the left to defend our democracy. This is important. When I talk to Democrats, I mean, Democrats are admiring Liz Cheney because she put country over party. That used to be table stakes. It's not. It's the ultimate test. And there, I believe, is fundamentally more that unites us than divides us. But it's why I'm, I'm so focused also on taking the American flag, black flag back. It belongs to all of us. And, and, you know, if you could see, I got some bumper stickers made, one of which I'd always wanted to see. And so now that I'm running, I said, you know what? I'll just make it myself. It says, proud American, proud Democrat. Yeah. I, I think yeah. we need to embrace this because not only are we the party of freedom, the party of equality, uh, and, and the party of equal opportunity, the party of generational responsibility. These are the tenets of what it means to me to be a common sense Democrat. Uh, but we are fighting for patriotic values and broader defense of our democracy. And if people don't understand the moral urgency and moral clarity of this election, they need to. But we need to make sure they understand that this is a great positive moment for us to get past Trumpism and then build a new kind of politics together. Uh, that's wow. the opportunity for this election. I, I agree wholeheartedly, you know, and along those lines, you know, that what's been a shocking to me is how the Republicans are, are, are basically 
smearing America, right? They're 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 saying hor horrible things about our country. You know, Don, I guess freaking Trump just literally smeared Milwaukee, the, the, the city they're having there. They're having their, their convention. You know, they're trying to convince everyone crime is rampant, and immigration is a form of evil. We we know we're seeing on the the truth though is we've seen a record drop in crime in the last year. And you yep. yourself, you're the grandson of immigrants, I believe, right? So you know, how do you change that narrative, John? I mean, how do we change the narrative to make sure it's clear that average people understand that crime is not rampant and that immigrants aren't a danger that the strength of our country we need to play offense on these issues you know tom swazi in our, our neighboring new york three uh set really reminded folks first of all that any you know narratives don't don't buy narratives of inevitability people said oh you know long island's going red bs you know he won by eight points and it's because he reminded us can't quality matters you know playing offense on the issues people care about matters seizing the center matters which obviously is is how you win a swing district. It's how you win the country. But let's talk about both those issues. I mean, first of all, as you say, we got to remind people that violent crime rose under Trump. It's fallen under Biden. We got to remind tell people that, look, Democrats believe in being tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. And if you want to talk about defund the police, I was knocking on doors in Smithtown and I talked to an FBI agent right when that Republican budget was being proposed. And he said, you know what? Talk about defund the police. They're cutting us 6%. That's going to hurt. And and a guy like Nick Lodo, you play offense. You say, you know what? You voted to cut the cops program, federal funding for local law enforcement. You voted to cut the FBI budget over four hundred million dollars. Yeah. Um, that's the opposite of law and order. When he tweeted out that, uh, that the conviction of Trump was a evidence of Banana Republic. You know what evidence of Banana Republic is? Supporting a candidate who's campaigning on pardoning people who attacked the U.S. Capitol on your behalf. So play yeah. offense on these issues. They're not the party of law and order. They're the party that's actually trying to defund the police and law enforcement. Second thing, immigration. I am the grandson of immigrants. My, my one father, grandfather escaped the Spanish influenza epidemic when he was orphaned. The other was born in Argentina, family that had fled the Balkan Wars and came through Ellis Island. He, uh, he was the best man I knew, World War II veteran in the Pacific Theater, lived in Youngstown, Ohio, raised five kids. And they're the reason I'm so patriotic. And they're the reason I understand on a deep visceral level that we cannot take the blessings of American democracy for granted. So here too on immigration reform, you got to play offense. And 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 this is where Nicola Loda taken the knee that second Trump told him to on, 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 on mocking the bipartisan border security bill. Now we all remember Democrats understand we need comprehensive immigration reform. That's how we solve this problem. Biden's proposed it, Obama proposed it. Before that, Ted Kennedy and John McCain tried to work on this. Uh, but when Republicans insisted on a standalone border security bill, attaching it to Ukraine funding and Israel funding and Taiwan, Democrats said, look, we think there should be comprehensive, but fine, we'll work with you. And they came up with what, you know, Lankford and, and, and Murphy came up with what the Wall Street Journal said was the toughest border security bill anyone could ever get. And then Trump pulled the plug and they all took the knee. And what it shows is, and I think people understand this, but we need to hammer it home. They want to fear monger off immigration. They want to fundraise off those fears, but they don't want to fix it. And that's a firing offense. They don't get to claim they're the party that takes immigration reform seriously. So when Nick Lolota tweets out, my, my, my nine-year-old could have done a better job negotiating this bill than James Langford, he, he doesn't get to claim credibly that he's the part, that he represents a party that takes this issue seriously. He doesn't. We need to get it comprehensive immigration reform done. It's good for the economy. It's good for farmers with the temporary workers they need. It's important to strengthen enforcement of our laws. We need a, 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 enough judges, by the way, to adjudicate asylum claims in a, in a rapid way. It's good for getting dreamers out of the shadows and creating pathways to citizenship. It's the win-win. And the real disruption of the system is doing something about it and not letting people invest it and letting the problem fester win because that ends up eroding faith in immigration, which is our greatest source of national strength. It's yeah. a renewable resource. And, and when people them. hear in this, all the, the demonization of migrants, I just remember them, and this is me putting on my historian hat. We've heard the same BS every new generation of immigrants that have come to our country. It happened to my family. I'm sure it happened to your family. Don't mm -hmm. buy it, but let's fix it. Let's get comprehensive immigration reform in place. And by the way, we should have every graduating high school senior take the same test that a newly naturalized citizen does. <laughs> that, that would there be nice stuff. That, that, would, that would level the playing field quite a bit. Well, okay. John, I know you got to get going. Go hit the road again. I, I think I'm holding you back. The most no, important man. question I ask in every interview, John, the most important question, 
Where can our wonderful Minus Mighty and, and supporters and followers and listeners find you, find more information, maybe throw you a donation and get their support? I appreciate that. JohnAvalon.com. I'm on Twitter at John Avalon, Instagram the same. We've got a primary coming up in a few days. This could not be more critical. My opponent is a self-funder. She put in New York Times a big article. She couldn't get organic support. So she gave herself $1.2 million to run negative ads against me. Just the kind of BS, you know, fear mongering that we expect from Republicans without any plan to win. Because again, last time she ran 10 points behind Biden. So this is really a test about whether the positive defeats the negative. It's a chance for us to prove that the politics of addition defeats the politics of division. That's what this campaign stands for. We're down the stretch. I would be honored to have everybody's support, financial enthusiasm. We got to win because if we win here, it's a majority maker. We'll take the house, take it to the bank. I love it. Get to work. I'm proud. Thanks, man. Thanks for taking time for us, man. It's great talking to you and, and you know, best of luck out there. Thanks, man. Appreciate you, friend. Be well. Thanks for your time. Man, what a great conversation with a great candidate. Uh, I followed John for years. I think we ran the same circles. Uh, so you know, give him some support. Let him know how it's going. They've got that election. The primaries coming up. Then a big election. Again, that's a that's a Biden district, one of the 18. So it is on the cusp. And uh, we can take back that district and take back the House. Another great conversation of on the hot seat. We'll be presenting a lot more. As you know, this is getting to be a regular thing. i got some incredible candidates lined up. They're, they're, they're knocking the door down. So if you're a candidate out there, you're a campaign staffer, get hold of me. I'd love to talk to you guys about how we can take this country back, preserve democracy, and truly live what we all dreamed of for America. I'm Fred Wellman, host of On Democracy, the FP Wellman, every Friday night at 11 p.m. right here on the MySouch Network. We'll see you soon. Keep up the fight.